Welcome to UO Today. I'm Steve Shankman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our first guest is Priscilla Pena Ovalle, an assistant professor in the Department of English. She earned her BS at Emerson College, her MA and her PhD in Cinema Television Critical Studies at the University of Southern California, and she came to Oregon in 2006. Her research interests include film history, the representation of race, Latino, Latina studies, and dance in film. Her current work in progress is focused on dance and the performance of Latina sexuality in Hollywood film. It's great to have you with us. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, when did you start getting interested in, in film and knowing that that's something you wanted to study in a kind of professional academic way? Well, it's actually interesting because I didn't start out with it as an academic pursuit. Um, my high school was a magnet school oh, uh, wow. when I was in San Antonio growing uh -huh. up. So uh, I started out taking foreign languages. I took Latin and then um, realized it was media program available. And once that, once I realized that was available to me, I just s switched gears and became uh, obsessed with media and editing and doing all that sort of production side of things. And once. Uh, I don't know, once I, once I was there, I was hooked. So I continued out doing media, and as a result of that, uh, got to do some productions with local PBS and uh, things like that, and realized mm -hmm. that I really wanted to make media. And uh, as a result, went on to Emerson College and uh, just where, pursued where, it. Where is Emerson College? Emerson's in Boston. It's uh -huh. right on the Boston Gardens and the Commons. Uh, uh -huh. It's one of those sort of campus on the Commons and within right. the city. So were you able to, to pursue these media interests there? I was, yes. Uh -huh. It was nice. I, it, they have, it's very media focused. So there was uh, television and film production. There was a theater production and that sort of thing. And so I started out with uh, doing film production, but realized it was really expensive and didn't really have the uh, means to afford it. So I ended up doing a lot of more media, new media production, mm -hmm. which was very computer based and pretty solitary and didn't really require as much capital as I needed mm -hmm. to make. Uh, you know, moving pictures. So, mm -hmm. did that, but ended up on a lot of other people's productions, and that was nice. So I got right. a lot of experience that right. way. So, how do you feel as somebody who's actually doing media stuff, and then you you become a scholar or a critic of media? I mean, mm -hmm. how do you where where does the where does the sort of creative and scholarly sides? How do they? How do, yeah. How, how, do you, how do you how did you decide where you were going to fit yourself into that? It's a daily battle. <laughs> it's like some days you wake up thinking, oh, you know, I really uh, enjoy one aspect of it, but knowing uh, what I do about the processes and the sort of cultural aspects of it, it makes you rethink things. But um, I think I just really was inspired by a college professor I had uh, mm -hmm. that, started, that introduced me to theory and really showed me what was possible uh, with that. And her name's Jane Shattuck. I there. see. Yeah. At, 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 at Emerson. At Emerson. Yeah. And that's what made you feel you could you wanted to do this from from that perspective. Exactly, mm -hmm. and uh, once I realized that that was even an option, um, I just it opened a whole new world. So I, th I saw it as complementary, not really overshadowing one or the other, but it gave me a new way of approaching and working within film uh, in a way that wasn't necessarily as uh, s limited as production. Right, we, I mm -hmm. had a Hollywood dream, and I think many of us have Hollywood dreams, but yeah. they're very limited opportunities in that sense. So right. I just love film so much; I wanted to be involved in any way I could. Yeah. And so I saw this was uh, another avenue I could explore in that way. Because if you're involved in production, I guess you're going to probably, at least at the beginning, have a rather specialized thing to do. Yeah. That you're not really analyzing, or you're not you're not sort of getting the big picture the way you can, I guess, as a, as a scholar. Yeah, and scholarship, I think, allows you to really try all these different things out in a way and just be attentive to them. And I think my production background really enhanced my uh, scholarship and allows me, I think, to talk about things now, especially in the classroom, in a way that maybe um, if I hadn't been aw as aware of what happens on a production uh, on a set or mm -hmm. on the day-to-day -day activity of making something, I think that, um, if anything, it's enhanced my abilities. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So when you, you I, I'm always very uh, admiring of, of, of people in your field because, you, you, you know, you go into this classroom and you've got to have all the technology sort of working for you. That takes a tremendous amount of, of uh, knowledge and, and background. So yeah. tell me about that. Do things usually go right in your, in, Sometimes. In your classes? Sometimes. <laughs> uh -huh. Things go well and things go not so well and uh -huh. you learn how to, you know, 
do a little sideshow to you while know, you're while you're fixing while stuff. fixing the technical problems. But uh -huh. it's actually been really nice here. I think there's a really supportive um, staff that really helps at any turn. Mm -hmm. If something goes wrong, everybody's there to, to really help out. So that's been nice. But I think the nice thing about it is that at this point, it's not so hard to be technologically savvy. If you know how to use Microsoft Word, mm -hmm. you can use Microsoft PowerPoint pretty quickly and pretty easily and make it make the, the classroom experience a little bit more multimedia, whether you're teaching Shakespeare or um, Hollywood dance films, which I'll be teaching next term. Yeah, but still, you know, I go into a class, and I've, I've got the book, and you know, that, that's all I need. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm really, uh, you know, getting away with, with, with murder. <laughs> what <laughs> you've got to do to prepare to prepare your your classes. Well, it's some, it's fun, you know. Yeah. It, it's it's uh, there's the joy of the image, right? Mm -hmm. If you put something up and just one frame will really spark a discussion in ways that sometimes uh, text yeah. has a, a a harder time doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think. Of course, a talented professor will be able to start conversations no matter what, but mm -hmm. as uh, somebody who's still learning the process, I think the ability to show an image that we're all familiar with, I yeah. think, is nice to get people engaged. So tell me about your, uh, your research uh, interests. You've been working on, um, I guess you call it sort of a comparative analysis, Rita Hayworth and Jennifer Lopez, you know, sort of yoking these two figures that I think probably, you know, you wouldn't think to put together, Exa huh? Exa <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. But that, that's, after all, what genius is, isn't it? I mean, yoking things together that people hadn't really thought of putting together. Yeah. So tell me how you came up with this this, this, this project this and, and, where, and, where, and where it's going. Well, one of the things that, in my exploration of film history and film theory, the thing that I really liked was uh, that I was really interested in Latina representation, you know, Latin American women within the U.S. and how they were portrayed. And when I realized pretty early on that dance played a significant component in their representation, I was really thrilled because I love dance and mm -hmm. I love film, so the ability to marry them in something I was very passionate about was great. So mm -hmm. I started looking at Latina celebrities over the years since the 20s to the present in, in film and realized that almost all of them had dance either on screen or had known, been known as dancers and that was their step into Hollywood. So that's how I kind of explored it that way and you know Rita Hayworth was actually born uh, Rita Gansino. She was a Spanish Irish, uh, she was a daughter of a Spanish father and an Irish American mother and born in the U.S. and actually was ex um, discovered in Mexico. So she has this sort of Latina history that was in some ways erased but not completely when she was transformed into the this glorious redhead right, Rita right. Hayworth. Yeah. So thinking about her transformation in order to access Hollywood was really nicely done in comparison to Jennifer Lopez who's gone through her own sorts of transformations right. over the years. So how many, how many, what would you say the common knowledge is about Rita Hay Hayworth and her, and her ethnic origins? <laughs> I mean you, you were saying it's both expo ex uh, What's the word you used? Exploited or, mm -hmm. or, ju or and also covered over. I mean, which which, which prevails? It? Which which prevails more in yeah. in, in, her, in the representation of her? Of who think, she is in the films? Yeah, I think now uh, you know we've kind of gotten away from that. Uh, we don't. We know Rita Hayworth is Rita Hayworth, and a lot of times, unless you know, you might not think that she was ever anything but. Um, but there's actually, at the time, a lot. There's a recent work, uh, a woman named Adrian McLean, who showed that people at the time were really interested in the fact that she had once been Rita Cancino, dark hair, all these at other the things. At the time. At the time, uh -huh. and uh, had been transformed. So they were really interested in that transformation process. The the fans were really excited about that. So mm -hmm. they were knew about it, and I think that that's kind of dying down over the years. But um, if you look closely at her films, I think you can see little glimmers of of that past and that history in. Mm -hmm in her performances mm -hmm. and in the stories that are told uh, about her. I and think. what about Jennifer Lopez? Well, Jennifer Lopez, if you know, we all know Jennifer Lopez from her posterior, right? We all know mm -hmm. J-Lo's butt. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that the way that uh, attention to her body has really gone on has uh, changed over as well. You know, the, as she got increasingly more mainstream roles, less ethnicized roles, the way that mm -hmm. she sort of presented herself has, has changed. She's Jenny from the block when she's on MTV, but when she's in, um, for example, Monster-in-Law, she's something a little bit different. She's got sort of lightened hair and straightened hair, and it's very different from what she started out playing in films like Money Trainer and Selena in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. so there's, you know, everybody transforms for Hollywood, but how that happens with more overtly ethnicized bodies, I think is really interesting. Um, 
tell me about your classes. Tell me, t tell me about what you, what you teach, or tell, tell our audience about what you teach. Yeah, I'm actually really excited. I just finished uh, my first term of a class called Race and Representation here, uh, and it, I, it's an, a class that's sort of uh, going to be, I think, a 300 level in next year, but at the moment it's a 199, and it's, it's a really and exciting that's an thing. that's experimental, experimental? It's an experimental number, yeah. so right mm -hmm. now it's trying to find its permanent place, right. hopefully. But um, I love that class because I, I like to engage people in discussions about race and representation and start thinking about what it means to talk about race in a way that is very mainstream. So we watch films like uh, Money Train, or we watch films like... Um, I don't know, Say the Last Dance. We think about them as very popular films, but also films that help us to some degree understand race and racial representation and racial relationships within the United States. And mm -hmm. I like the idea that you can have something very mainstream that helps us understand these things for better or for worse mm -hmm. um, on a very, very deep level. So in a 10-week in a term, how many films do you do? You, do, you, do you do we watch? Yes. Yeah, um, we tend to watch actually one every week. Uh -huh. We have a little extra time in the film classes to do that. And uh, as a result, you know, we have a, a film a week and then we get to talk about it pretty in depth, mm -hmm. um, really think about it and discuss it. And so I teach that class and I also teach next term, I'll be teaching a class called uh, Hollywood Dance Film. And that film is really, that class is really exciting for me because it brings my love of dance and film and racial representation and issues of class and sexuality together through films like Flashdance and Footloose and Save the Last Dance. So mm -hmm. take very, again, mainstream films and break them down in terms of these other kinds of things. Yeah, and, and I guess there hasn't been a, 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 a class taught like that in the... So with far. that title in, yeah. the, in the English department? Not to my knowledge, <laughs> at least I hope not. So mm -hmm. this is, I think, the first time that it'll be taught. And um, it's my love, so hopefully people will come and join it mm -hmm. either next term or whenever else it comes mm -hmm. back on the mm -hmm. books. So what are you writing on now then at the, at the moment? Where, where, where do you focus your, 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 your scholarship when you're, not, when you're not teaching? Yeah, um, well, you know, right now I, I'm really into, again, dance and race and representation. So I'm finishing up this work with the Latina uh, body and Latina celebrity as a dancer, um, mm -hmm. which was my dissertation at USC and which will hopefully now become a really popular manuscript, which everyone will read. And that's but the one with Rita, with Rita Hayworth Rita, in Rita it. Rita Hayworth and uh -huh. Jennifer Lopez. But uh -huh. I'm also interested in doing something more about those mainstream dance films, um, looking at breakdancing, for example, in flash dance, or um, you know, the idea of dance as sort of taboo and teen rebellion and Footloose and thinking about the role that dance and race played for us in the golden era of the dance films, which was, of course, the 1980s. So mm -hmm. I'm really, really excited about those. Projects. Well, tell us in the minute or so left the the, the, the kind of environment you found found here because you're you're in an English department mm -hmm. you're teaching you're teaching film how does that how is that how has that worked for you? It's actually worked really well. I think it's nice to have uh, I have the support of a large department and a, a you know well respected department. Um, my colleagues are have been nothing but generous and kind with their time and you know teaching expertise and just uh, tips for how to how to do well mm -hmm. as a professor and as a scholar. Um, so there's that n niceness of it, but then there's also the smaller faculty that focus primarily on film, and so I have the, the, both the large mm -hmm. family and the smaller family unit to work together. And of course, my students have been really great, so yeah. I'm really enjoying my time here. Excellent, well, it's yeah. been great having you on it's the show. It's been nice having uh, this time to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we've been speaking with Priscilla Peña Ovalle, Assistant Professor in the Department of English. Thank you for watching. Welcome back to UO Today. Our next guest is Enrique Lima, an assistant professor in the Department of English. Enrique Lima earned his AA at Portland Community College, his BA at the University of Oregon, and his PhD in Comparative Literature at Stanford. He came to the University of Oregon in 2006. His research and teaching interests include literature of the Americas, the 19th century American novel, narrative theory, and the theory of the novel, as well as Native American and Central American fiction and the literature of the Mexican Revolution. He is currently working on a book manuscript entitled Forms of Conquest, Indian Conflict, and the Novel in the Americas. In addition to his native languages uh, of English and Spanish, he is conversational in Italian and has a reading knowledge of Portuguese. Welcome. It's great to, great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. 
you're a wonderful, uh, a wonderful addition to the to the English department. Thanks. Uh, uh, we we were talking before we we, we uh, went on on camera uh, that you have a doctorate from Stanford in comparative literature, and we s compared notes on that. So uh, if you could give our audience an idea of what what does comparative literature mean for you? It means uh, the ability to understand uh, literature, and for me, the novel, be because that's my that's a narrative mode that I'm most familiar and comfortable uh -huh. with. It means being able to understand it in a transnational context. That is, literature doesn't stop at uh, national borders. Mm -hmm. uh, influences don't stop at, na at national borders. And so in order to have a fuller sense of the way literature functions uh, as uh, an evolving cultural form, you have to, I think, to be able to understand it in, this trans in a transnational context. Mm -hmm. And so at Stanford, what did you? What were you comparing? What 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 languages and literatures were you reading? Well, my issue, you know, m the issue which I did, it, I pursued in my dissertation, and which I'll pursue in the book manuscript, is uh, the the significance of Indian conflict in the Americas to, de to the development of the novel throughout mm -hmm. the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, I focused on literature of U.S., uh, Mexico, and Central America, which is of course very very broad, mm -hmm. but uh, I it's because there's so many cultural, political, historical connections between the U.S., uh, Mexico, and Central America, it seemed a good place to begin mm -hmm. to, to do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. So very ambitious, broad scope. I mean, how many, how many, how many novels were involved in this, are involved in this study? Well, for, I mean, and from when to when? Yeah, the, from when to when. I, I guess, you know, I'm interested to see how the, the novel in the Americas after independence, so after the wars of, of, the, of independence, how uh, the novel changes then you know, the, how it adapts to this sort of changing national context. Mm -hmm. So I begin with Cooper and uh, James Fenimore Cooper at the in the 19th century as the, you know, what's often considered the sort of uh, patriarch of the American novel. Mm -hmm. uh, I see how the development of, of the novel in the U.S. is tied to Western expansion. And so I close that period with another chapter on Willa Cather. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that sort of constitutes one period of the uh, development of novel in the Americas. Then I look at uh, the novels of the Mexican Revolution, uh, along with uh, this uh, Guatemalan writer named uh, Miguel Angel Asturias, to see how, uh, how Indian conflict in Latin America as a continuing political and uh, Frankly, Marshall Project, as a war, uh, mm -hmm. a project of war, and uh, this kind of armed insurrection continues to be addressed by literature. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and again, for our for our for our audience out mm -hmm. there, when people used to talk about American literature, mm -hmm. I guess they meant North America, yeah. and they meant the United States Usually of America. The US, yeah. So now, when people talk about American literature or literature of the Americas, mm -hmm. uh, tell us about that. That is a field. It's a field. I mean, it's a it's a it's a developing field. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of uh, theoretical issues that are unresolved. Uh, what do we mean by uh, literature of the Americas? Do we mean the relationship of the U.S. and the rest of the Americas? Do we mean the relationship of the nation states of the Americas? Do we mean uh, historical problematics that transcend all of the Americas? Uh, all those things. All mm -hmm. those are still open debates. Mm -hmm. I I side with with the. La the sort of the last of those three choices. That is, to me, Indian conflict is one of the uh, one of the fundamental features of the sort of his history of the Americas, of the geographies of the Americas, and it allows us to think of how the United States here is uh, as important, of course, as hegemonic, of course, as uh, significant, of course, as it's been to the Americas. How to it here constitutes a part of a broader mm -hmm. history, a broader. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, broader patterns of, of uh, you know, social formation and right. so forth. So give us an example of, uh, you know, you, you, you've got people out there that may know something about American literature, but mm -hmm. how this approach kind of, well, James Fenimore Cooper, for example, mm -hmm. you can talk about him or, or anybody, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how this idea of looking at uh, the idea of the, 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 the uh, conflict with, uh, with Indian culture in, mm -hmm. in the Americas, you know, not just the United how does that How does this sort of illuminate mm -hmm. um, uh, American, what, what people, you know, North American literature? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so, so James Fenimore Cooper is uh, writing about, uh, um, writing about uh, the conflict on the frontier 
he's writing in the historical period. He's writing in, of course, the beginning, uh, sort of early part of the of the nineteenth century, roughly from eight, uh, from eighteen twenty to eighteen forty five, roughly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's writing about in a, the sense of writing about that contemporary conflict and in conflict. He's writing about it as if it were uh, the historical past. This creates, uh, mm. you know, a problem in a kind of in time for Cooper. You know, how to write about the, pre the historical present as if it were the historical past, right? Uh, and so he, for instance, in The Last of the Mohicans, mm -hmm. you know, he locates the disappearance of the Mohican people in, uh, you know, in the 18th century, right? In the 18th century. And, uh, which, of course, is historically inaccurate for all sorts of reasons, the last being in which the Mohicans are alive and well in Wisconsin to this day. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so this, this, you know, this idea of putting the historical present into this, projecting into the past, becomes a way to resolve symbolically, mm -hmm. that is resolve in the imagination, an ongoing historical problem. Yeah. Which, for me, is you know, one of the, uh, what I often write about literature, I often write about the novel in specifically formal terms. Mm -hmm. I, I write about it in formal terms precisely because to me, what literature does, what the novel does, is it tries to resolve, it tries to resolve its own historical contradictions in formal ways. Mm -hmm. So the, the problematic uh, understanding of time in the, in the Fenimore no Leather Talking novels, tales by, by Fenimore Cooper, is this sort of formal you know, problem uh, this is the formal solution to this historical problem that mm -hmm. he encounters. Um, how to imagine the historical present of any conflict by projecting into the past and having that sense of time I inform the, 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 the novels themselves. Right. So, um, does he resolve it or does he, mm -hmm. or, does, or does he evade it? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, 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 uh, in other words, mm -hmm. How how does how does that reflect what's sort of going on in his own in yeah. his own time? Mm -hmm. The reflection, in, you know, the, the the having said it in the past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, um, I think he resolves. It. I mean, because you know, I I, I tend to look at Fenimore Cooper in terms of the Letters Talking Tales as a whole, mm -hmm. and so you know, the Letters Talking Tales as a whole, and that is the last novel in the series written, which is the Deerslayer, uh -huh. is the first novel in the kind of imaginary temporality of the novels, right? right. It's the novel in which the, the main character of the, of the tale, Danny Bumpo, is in his youth, mm -hmm. right? It's in his youth. So he then makes all of this already known future, right? We know, you know, from the vantage point of the Deerslayer, you know, written 20 some odd years after the first of the Letters Talking Tales, we know everything that will happen I see. to Natty, I right? See. And so, and, and so it, what he does is he makes this sort of impossible time of U.S. nationalism, right? Because Indians don't ever disappear. The frontier never quite closes, never quite manages. Right. He turns that imaginary time into a real time, uh -huh. right? It, he sort of closes in this, in this fictional, symbolic way, right? right? So he, he turns this imaginary temporality into the real temporality uh -huh. of, of the novel. Yeah. So is that what you mean by proleptic nostalgia? That's what I mean by proleptic uh -huh, nostalgia, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, ha but that, how does that? Where does that leave the situation at at the moment? I mean, how, how does that? How does that interact with what's really going on mm -hmm, at mm -hmm. the moment? I mean, politically, what see, sort of what sort of effect does it well, have? You well, know, see, that's a, I can say that that's not an issue that's terribly important to me because I see. there's to me there's the two ways of thinking about the historicity of literature. Uh -huh. One is to say. What is, the his, what is the social function of literature, right. which is what your question gets at. How does it function in the world? How does it, uh, how is, you know, the perfect case in the American, uh, in the American context would be Uncle Tom's Cabin, right? It's a yeah. novel that has huge political social ramifications. Right. Uh, this is, a, you know, uh, for novels like this, for novels like right. Uncle Tom's Cabin, it's important to think about the social function of literature. Yes. I tend to think of literature a little bit differently. Uh -huh. I think, to, I like to focus on the social significance of literature. Is how does literature imagine its own historical condition? Right. What is what its function in society is? Yeah. It's a different issue to me. Right. That's, I see what you mean. Yeah. Now again, we talked about Stanford earlier on. Did you study with Moretti? Yes, of and, course. And, and, and tell me. You know, we have only about four minutes. Yeah. In, in, in you know, tell me because he's he's everybody just speaks so highly of him. Mm -hmm. What what is it about this this critic Franco Moretti that mm -hmm. is, seems to be so captivating, so riveting for people? Well, he's got the Center for the Novel yeah, at yeah. Stanford. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, what is it? I mean, a part of it is, I mean, the man has this kind of inspirational value. Uh -huh. You know, in, in this time when so often, uh, you know, 
literary critics who are often uh, you know much too cool for school will say you know literature you know literature and culture has you know a kind of marginal existence he insists on both the seriousness of studying literature and also uh, you know trying to understand its significance and why that matters in other words he makes the study of literature important uh -huh. right uh, so there's a kind of inspirational value in that uh, the other I mean, this is, in a sense, kind of older already because, uh, you know, the, the, the directions that uh, Frank Moretti's work has taken him and, you know, take him a little far afield from the things I'm interested in. He's I interested see, now in I a see. properly sociological, uh -huh. right, quantitative study of literature. Right. Uh, I like, uh, you know, his earlier work, which to me follows on the tradition of the series that's most important in my work, which mm -hmm. is that of uh, George Lukács. I see. Uh, yeah. So, which is, you know, this idea of, you know the the kind of uh, the the history of symbolic form. Right, yeah. right. So uh, the effect that that novel had in its time doesn't interest you so much as the problems that the writer is 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 working exactly. out. Exactly. I mean, because that's the nature of historical interpretation, yeah. right? The nature of historical interpretation is not we have historical knowledge and then that explains the novel. Rather, we have some historical knowledge. We engage the novel and we leave the novel with histor with more historical knowledge than we entered. Mm -hmm. So tell, are you teaching next quarter? Yes. Right. And tell me, just give us an idea of what you're, what you're going to be doing. I'm going to be teaching the 20th century American novel class, uh -huh. uh, which I teach by, in, in fact, ignoring most of the 20th century. Uh -huh. I teach it by focusing on 20 years, uh -huh. um, 20 years, roughly from about 1920 to 1940, where I uh, try to examine the kind of, uh, what I call the traditions of, American, uh, of, of the American novel. So I look at these uh, foundational texts uh, in, in the, the traditions of the African American novel, of the Native American novel, uh, of um, of uh, uh, the Chicano novel, and so forth. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and 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 that's your class for and, the and a graduate seminar as oh, well. And tell me about that because uh, tell me what what it's on. Well, it's uh, the, it's called a uh, uh, novel, the novel in the nation, uh -huh. the nation novel. I don't remember one or uh -huh. the other. Uh -huh. uh, and for me, it's of course on method. So I'll be teaching there. Uh, works that have been influential in my thinking about the relationship between nation and novel. And it, it's a, a course designed to teach graduate students the methods of, of the analysis of the novel. Mm -hmm. Enrique, thank you. I told you it would go really fast. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. Great. Thank you. And we've been speaking today with Priscilla Peña Ovalle and Enrique Lima, assistant professors in the Department of English. Thank you for watching.